Hello and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for March 16th, 2020. Uh, I'm Scott. I work for Adafruit on CircuitPython all the time. Uh, so please support Adafruit. They've invested heavily in CircuitPython and made it awesome, even though it's all open source. Uh, you can go to adafruit.com and shop there to support Adafruit. Um, this meeting is our chance to connect with our community and hear about everything that's going on within the realm of CircuitPython from Blinka to projects. And uh, everyone is welcome to attend. It happens uh, typically Mondays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. Uh, we ha it happens almost every week. Uh, if we do shift it around, uh, we let the circuit Pythonistas roll on Discord know by mentioning them. So if you want to get pinged about uh, changes, please ask us to be a part of the circuit Pythonistas role. You'll have a, a nice purple name badge as well to go along with that. Uh, this meeting is run in five parts. Uh, we run through this every week because we occasionally get new people. So again, everyone is welcome. Uh, the first part is community news, where uh, Phil, if he's available, will run us through all the things that have happened on the internet uh, around CircuitPython, all the cool stuff that's going on. It's a preview of the the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter that comes out tomorrow. Uh, after community news, we do State of CircuitPython Libraries in Blinka, which is a st statistical overview of the health of the project meant to ground us in kind of objective measures. Uh, because we'll get into the touchy-feely stuff in the next section, but uh, State of Circuit Python gets us uh, rooted in numbers that we care about. Uh, after that, we do hug reports, which is uh, done as a round robin. So I will start, and then we go through the folks in the voice chat one by one, so everybody has a chance to say something. And hug reports is uh, um, taking some time out of our week to thank the folks for the uh, really... Uh, nice things that they've been doing. So this is a time to say thanks. It's really helpful to give recognition to folks, and it's also helpful for us to realize the things that we value as a community. Um, so that's done as a round robin. Uh, if you are in the voice chat but do not want to participate, you're just here to listen in, that's totally cool. Uh, let us know in the text channel, the CircuitPython text channel, that you're lurking. And then we'll also mark on the uh, the notes doc that you're lurking as well, so that when I'm reading through it, I know that I can say, like, oh, this person's lurking. Um, if you're in the voice channel and you have notes, you have hug reports, uh, please drop them in the uh, notes doc or drop them in the text chat before your turn so that when I get there, I can read them off. Uh, that's uh, totally cool. Uh, this meeting is recorded. I forgot to say that earlier. So your voice will be recorded and the video from the CircuitPython text channel is recorded as well. So please be aware of that. And if you opt to not uh, have uh, your voice recorded, totally cool. I'm happy to read it off for you. Uh, the next section is done as a round robin as well. So same, same guidelines apply there, uh, except this is status updates, which is a chance for you to say a bit briefly about what you've been working on in the past week or since you've last kind of dropped into the meeting, and then talk about kind of future, future work that you're doing as well. Um, it's a great way to just have a feel for what everyone's doing and give tips and tricks across uh, between people for in case there's like, oh, like make sure you look into this or this was worked on before and here's the issues of that. Um, so that's status updates. And then the last section that we have is uh, in the weeds, which is uh, kind of a, a general free for all for if you have questions that like Dan or I or Jeff or somebody else can answer for you. Uh, that's a good place to talk about it. It's at the end so that we can go into depth if we need to. Uh, if you have topics for In the Weeds, please drop them in the In the Weeds section with your username uh, in the notes doc so that when we get there, we can just breeze through it and uh, and go through it all. So this is a uh, this was typically about an hour, but we've had more people. So uh, kind of prepare yourself for about uh, 90 minutes of circuit Python goodness. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact and uh, 90 minutes sounds like a long time, we do take notes and in the notes we have time codes. So you'll hear me stop and stutter, but that's me synchronizing our notes with the, the time on the recording so that you can skip through all the things that you want to hear. And with that, I will take a time code and hand it over to Phil for community news. All right. Thank you so much, Scott. Mm -hmm. All right. So 
we had started this whole circuit python thing as code plus community and now more so than ever i'm so happy that we can all come together every single week uh we'll be doing a lot more together and a lot more people will be coming in is my guess so we are now 17,000 people on discord congratulations everyone um we have a lot of folks that decided to come in over the weekend due to school and work closures. Give them a warm welcome as they come in. I will be doing a blog post soon. And we also have some things for people to do this week. Starting Wednesday, we are changing the hours of show and tell. We've been doing this for a decade. It's usually been a half an hour. Um, sometimes it runs a couple minutes over, sometimes a little bit less. But we will be doing show and tell every Wednesday, 7 PM to 8 PM. This will probably be the biggest worldwide show and tell um, because it's the only one <laughs> uh, that's been consistent over the last decade. I hope other people copy this. I hope other people do it. All are welcome. People can show their work from home setups. They can show their circuit Python project. They can show their cats. They can show what their kids made while they were doing schoolwork from home. Whatever it is, uh, I will have more information. Please get the word out. I think a lot of people um, could use that break and it's something we're very good at so we'll get everybody in and out uh, within that hour before we do ask an engineer micromag issue number seven is the community made microbit magazine clue got a 10 out of 10 so um we didn't expect this uh the, they got a clue um haha pun intended um <laughs> They got a clue, and because it's microbit shaped, they decided to review it. Check it out. Um, it's a free download. Never been a better time to read free magazines online. Hackster IO got a clue. Uh, Alex is she's in our community. Also kicked the tires on it. Um, they have an MCU Monday microcontroller Monday feature. Watch the video with that. I've been collecting tweets. Thank you so much, everyone who tags things, adds things, uh, hashtags it. Um, I love reading these out. I try to. This is my mini mailbag that I try to have in our uh, our weekly chats here. Circuit Python is fast for prototypers. The working code is less than 100 lines, totally readable. If you already know Python, no tooling is necessary. Good example of what we're trying to do with Circuit Python. Um, we released a video for Adafruit IO. If you haven't tried it out and you want to get the uh, the trailer for it, essentially. Um, that is it. We also did a um, video series with Bob Martin and Microchip where we showed a lot of CircuitPython stuff. So those are good videos to catch up on. Um, Scott and team might want to talk about this later on in the vid chat. Uh, when I write the newsletter, my audience is uh, a lot of it. It's our team. So it looks like uh, some folks already got some more tiny uh, USB stuff going on for the ESP. 32 S2, so I linked that in there. Um, the Open Hardware Summit, they went virtual last week. They used, uh, I had talked to the organizers and had suggested, hey, check out StreamYard as they were trying to consider if they were gonna go virtual. It worked out, it's a good tool. It's what we use, it's what we're using for show and tell. Check out all the videos. Um, you'll notice a lot of CircuitPython stuff. Waz had a great talk on how can you actually maintain, and manage all the builds and firmware um, other examples that kept coming up was how we work together with the community, how we do open source software, how we do open source hardware. Um, you know, it's about six or seven hours of, of uh, video altogether, and there was also a Discord chat that you can check out. Um, Professor John G posted up free teaching resources for Circuit Python all in one spot over Google Docs. So check those out, especially if uh, you're an instructor and educator. Now's a good time to use this. And this is all part of our newsletter. This will be going out tomorrow, Tuesday, around 11 AM. Thank you for any of the ats, the hashtags, and all the things that keep the newsletter chock full of good things. And we'll see some of you here in Discord. Maybe some of you, please stop by uh, Wednesday if you're not doing anything between 7 and 8. Show off some projects and more. And I look forward to um, all the neat things that we're going to do together. And thank you so much, Scott. I'm going back to work. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Phil. I, yeah. ha I haven't actually seen the ESP32 forum thing, so that's definitely on my to-do list to look at later. That's right. I, this is, when, I, when I see stuff, I'm, I'm, like a, I'm like a truffle pig. I'm just like, ooh, Scott's going to like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the stuff on the tiny USB. I lurk on tiny USB, USB repo, but I don't lurk on the ESP32 forum yet. Yeah. That's my that's my quote of the I, day. I do always. I'm like a, I'm a truffle pig for Python news. <laughs> Good thing okay. there's lots of truffles out there. 
There is less truffles. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Um, next up, we have state of circuit Python libraries and Blinka. This is a chance for us to talk numbers. Uh, and the idea is that these are numbers that we feel like reflect the health of the project overall. Um, and we do this in uh, four parts. First, I'll talk overall, and then we'll talk core library and Blinka specifically. So uh, overall, let me take a time code. Uh, we had 314 pull requests merged, which is by far the largest number that I have ever seen in here. Uh, I think we we credit 13 authors for this, but I believe that the, the bulk of that is for, I know, for Pi Day. I know, I love that. Uh, I believe the bulk of that is uh, automated PRs done by Summersoft for updating the code of conduct. Uh, so we didn't just get a ton of contributors all at once. We just have one that's uh, really good at automating stuff. Uh, so folks folks to thank uh, who I haven't seen here uh, either frequently or at all. Uh, Richard A., uh, J. Reese, F. Gallier, D. Gloud, Geek Guy Wyoming, or, which I assume the W.Y. is. Uh, and then the other folks are regular. So thank you to all the authors. We had 12 reviewers, so thank you to that as well. I think that's one of the higher numbers of reviewers. And as always, uh, if you've been in this meeting before, we encourage folks to start by reviewing. It's really helpful. Uh, because we're so hardware focused, there's a lot of work to do just trying code on devices. And we really appreciate it when people are able to drop in and say, hey, I tried this thing. It works or, uh, or not. So uh, if you want to get started in contributing to CircuitPython, reviews are a great way to do it. Uh, lastly, in the overall section, or second to last, uh, we had 14 closed issues by nine people and 19 opened by eight people. So uh, more people involved in issues. Uh, we're up five, uh, but that's not the end of the world. Overall, I would say that we're close to doing 5.1 uh, with Microlab, which would be cool. Uh, we'll need to check in with Jeff on, and Zoltan with that. Uh, but no huge fallout from 5.0. I think people are using it and really enjoying it. So nice job, everybody, on making sure 5.0 is solid. Uh, it's actually quite surprising to me that we haven't done a 5.0.1. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, the libraries continue to grow. We, we're well, I, I don't know if we're well over 200, but we're definitely over 200 libraries. And that's a testament to Katni and the folks that have been leading the library work. So thanks to them. And then Blinka continues to grow as well. I, I'm always pleasantly surprised to see how many people in the CircuitPython and MicroPython forum on Adafruit are using Blinka on their single board computers. It's, it's awesome that people can go from the small micros all the way onto the Raspberry Pis of the world. So thank you to Melissa for leading that charge. And with that, uh, I'm going to talk about the core, and then we'll uh, go to Katni after that. So brain can't time code and talk at the same time <laughs> uh, for the core. Uh, we had four pull requests merged, so obviously we didn't contribute that many to the 314, although I guess we got the four in there, so that's cool. Uh, we had two authors, Higher Effect and TG Techie, so thank you to them both, and the two reviewers, Higher Effect and myself, uh, thank you to the reviewers as well. We have nine open pull requests. We only have one that's open, been open more than 100 days. Uh, I think Jeff deserves credit for uh, wrapping up the F string. Uh, PR that was open for over 200 days and, and got that merged in, or at least revived it so that we'll get it merged in shortly. Um, so that's nine open pull requests. On the issue side in the core, we had five closed issues by four people and six opened by four people. So we're net up one for a total of 200, 264 open issues. You can check the notes for link to all of the open issues. We have six ac active milestones. Uh, Thank you to Dan, who closed the older two. Uh, we have a 5x features and a 5xx bug fixes. Uh, we have a number open in bug fixes, but I don't believe they're urgent. So uh, that's no big deal. Most of them are long term, which is our designation for uh, stuff we want to do in the future, but not uh, are, that aren't immediately prior prioritized. And then uh, we do have a link to the download stats, but I don't believe it's actually working. Um, which is something we should do in the future. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Katni for libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So uh, across the libraries, we had 310 pull requests merged. 
Uh, many of those were the code of conduct update. The creation of said PRs was automated. The merging was not. Uh, so that was uh, a huge push that SummerSoft and I did. Um, and Foamy Guy also helped out uh, to get all of that merged um, over the over the weekend. So that was that's good though. All the code code of conduct is now the same across all the libraries as well as uh, Discord and the code of conduct repository. Um, so we had uh, of those 310, we had 11 authors. So not all of them were um, not all of them were code of conduct related, and uh, 11 reviewers. So thank you to everybody who has been participating in that and contributing. Um, all of your contributions are very important. In terms of merge pull request, I removed about five pages of the list from the notes, but I put a link to the library report if you're interested in seeing that astronomically long list. Um, it does show all the pull requests that were merged uh, over the last uh, week. And I left in the ones that were um, two days or more because those were not um, code of conduct related. Uh, which means we have 139 open pull requests. Our oldest one is 434 days. Uh, that one's a work in progress that hasn't been touched that I think we can probably just close it out and the author can reopen it if we want to uh, continue that. Um, but we need to take a look at the rest as well uh, as there are some others that are fairly old. Um, so we had nine closed issues by six people and 13 opened by four people. Uh, leaving us with 170 open issues. If you're interested in any of this information, it's available at circuitpython.org slash contributing. Um, you can find a list of open PRs, a list of open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues, all of which are great ways to get started contributing, as it were. Um, over the last week, we had one new library added and a number of updated libraries, uh, the list of which I will not read. Um, and that's where we are with the libraries. Awesome. Thanks, Katni. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, Blinka from Maker Melissa. Hello. Actually, I should have done a microphone test. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound good. <laughs> OK. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the thing moved on me here. Mm-hmm. Ah, here we are. Uh, OK, so we had zero pull requests merged by zero authors and zero reviewers. Uh, there were there are now zero open pull requests. Uh, there were zero closed issues. Um, there's uh, remaining 36 open issues. And there were 4,098 PyPI downloads in the last week, which is actually a big increase from what I normally see. Awesome. And we currently have 38 uh, boards supported. Great. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Uh, next up, we have Hug Reports. Hug Reports, as I said before, is a chance to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing. Uh, and we do it as a round robin. So just as a heads up, I don't know if anybody's new, but uh, please let us know if you're looking. Uh, if you don't know or don't remember whether we got it, you can always check the notes doc and make sure that you're, next to your name it says lurking or not. Uh, it's super helpful because then as I call on people, we can keep the pace up, which is good. Uh, so let me start talking about pace. Uh, I caught a number of them. First and foremost, I want to say uh, thank you to Katni and Dihirata for all the black and pilot work. Um, very cool to see uh, us r refining the, the formatting of all of our libraries and stumbling across some things that are kind of weird and good to get out of there. Um, Thank you to Jeff Epler and Paint Your Dragon for the upcoming Proto Matter uh, RGB display work. I'm very excited to see those displays supported. Um, and it's it's one of our first uh, collaborations with Paint Your Dragon to get the core C code shared between Arduino and CircuitPython, which I'm excited about. Um, thanks to uh, Lady Ada and PT for giving me the streaming keys to the kingdom uh, on this weekend. I streamed for about uh, I think it was about two hours, just over two hours, uh, not CircuitPython, but Tiny Logic Friend. And they uh, supported me and gave me the, the restream key. So I was on YouTube, didn't manage to work, but uh, Twitch and Facebook and LinkedIn and Periscope, I think, are the, the other four. Um, so thanks to them for that. And there's now a video up where I cut the first five minutes where it was just me uh, or just the splash screen for the first five minutes trying to get YouTube going. 
So that's up on YouTube now, which is youtube.com slash Adafruit. Uh, thank you to Summersoft, Foamy Guy, and Katni, as we've talked about for the Code of Conduct patches and continued Adabot, uh, Summersoft in particular for the Adabot maintenance. Um, thanks to Axiomatic for uh, just being more uh, participating more and uh, specifically looking into fixing the RGB support uh, Neo Neo or RGB status pixel support on the particle xenomes. And that'll be cool. And then lastly, a huge hug report to all of the folks at Oshawa, the Open Source Hardware Association. Uh, they had about a week to uh, switch from an in-person conference to a virtual conference. And it was really, the virtual conference was really well done. The Discord was well run. They had one channel per talk so that there was a place for people to talk specifically about a topic. I think they got all presenters except one uh, so they were pretty much on schedule, which was awesome. And it was great to see, uh, Michael as the host in, uh, StreamYard as, as Phil was talking about. So if you didn't watch that live, I, I recommend it. There's, uh, of, it's a great reminder of how, how diverse the uses of open source hardware, uh, are. And, uh, you should also watch to see, uh, how elephants relate to software bugs. So. That'll be a bit of a teaser. Okay, and with that, let's uh, circle back. I think I'm the the last on the list. Yeah, yeah, those of you who watched it know what I'm alluding to. Uh, I will just read off a couple here. It looks like uh, from Andrew Tribble, after I take a time code. Andrew Tribble says, group hug to all, missing the meeting. Anik Data says, uh, hug report to Foamy Guy for all the in-depth community support on CircuitPython and other troubleshooting. Anne is lurking as well and says group hug to all. Carter is lurking. Seagrover is text only and says uh, group hug to the team and community. I especially appreciate some of the recent work done to maintain a more uniform user interface, such as the change for LED matrix brightness. And to the maker community at large for stepping up to recent challenges to support the online community with free educational and teleworking tools. So that's from Seagrover. Uh, Charles is lurking, so we'll go to Dan. Okay, thank you. So uh, first of all, I'd like to give thanks to uh, Phil, who was on earlier, because he's spending a lot of his time during the day, these days, um, keeping Adafruit running uh, during the coronavirus crisis. They're doing all kinds of things to make sure that people can either work from home or stagger their shifts to take time off as necessary to care for people who are at home, like kids or uh, partners or elderly people. And Phil's being extremely proactive about this. They already have a paid sick time um, arrangement. They're being more flexible about that, that. It's really a model for how companies can work and continue to operate during this, 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 this crisis. It's very impressive. Okay, and in the same vein, I'd like to uh, thank the whole group for a warm and supportive community. It's wonderful to be able to have this available even when a lot of things are going wrong in the rest of the world. And finally, uh, thanks to AT Makers Bill, who's building a solar powered uh, uh, thing to go on his boat dock to measure like uh, the height of the tides and things like that and wants to make it work by solar power and has some interesting problems with uh, battery charging and brownout and things like that and, and is making us rethink about how safe mode and uh, brownout work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dan. All right, Dave P is lurking. Dave Glad is tech only, so I'll read those off. Uh, David says, hug report to maker Melissa for bootstrapping me on the bit buggy. Hug report to Lady Ada for accepting a PR that supports uh, for the scroll fat HD in CircuitPython IS31 FL3731. Uh, hug report to Tony DeCola for making the IS31 FL3731 library in the first place. And a second hug report to maker Melissa for the text scrolling example. All right, next up, we have notes from Drew. Drew says, uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the virtual open hardware summit. H thanks to CircuitPython for being a role model for an online community, open 
Hardware Summit used Discord effectively and also StreamYard. Thanks, PT. And thanks to those that joined the Badge Hacking channel on the OHS Discord and discussed concepts for CircuitPython apps. And then there's a link in the notes uh, for joining the Discord, which I'll plop in. Uh, it's not too late. It happened again. You could uh, wa re watch the video on YouTube and chime it there, uh, but no big deal. So thanks to Drew for dropping those notes in. Uh, next up, we have notes from Foamy Guy. Foamy Guy says Hug report to Deshipu for creating the Pew Pew devices. My Pew Pew M4 is scheduled to arrive this week. Super excited to play with it. Hug report to Jerry N for testing out an issue with the RGB LED on particle devices. Uh, group hug for this wonderful community. Getting more involved over the past few months has been incredible. I'm very happy for all the people I've met and things that I've learned along the way. And a hug report to Tan Newt, myself, and Maker Melissa for feedback on CircuitPython.org downloads page tutorial links PR, as well as Raspionic for initially adding many of those links. Okay, next up we have Geek Guy. Do you have a mic? You're not marked as lurking. Scroll back. I'm going to take it that you're lurking. <laughs> Woke up at 3. Yeah, I'm mo mostly lurking today. Woke up at 3.14 a.m. this morning. Cool. Okay, next up we have Hierophat. Um, so this week, uh, thanks to Tanut Scott for reviewing and approving a bunch of PRs um, this past week uh, and generally helping out getting stuff uh getting stuff merged quickly so I could work on the F7 and H7 stuff. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks to everyone who stuck to uh, stuck with the Open Source Hardware Summit. Um, despite the the move to virtual, I thought it was just a, an excellent summit despite, uh, despite being virtual. Um, the talks and panels were all really great. It was really great to hear so many stories and perspectives with that um, in spite of COVID. Uh, so... Uh, big shout out to the organizers there for pulling that off so well and to everyone who uh, who featured in that. It was really, really cool to see. Um, and uh, thanks to Summersoft for helping me out with some doc CI weirdness uh, last week. Uh, so, and group hug to everyone else. Thank you. Thanks, Hire Effect. Okay, next up we have Jeff. Hello. Uh, so I want to start off with a group hug. Uh, especially since we're not hugging so much in person these days. Um, and also everybody out there who made the Open Hardware Summit a success. I was only able to sit in on part of it, but I'm going to go back and watch more of those videos. And uh, yeah, it was it was amazing. Uh, thanks to Lady Ada, thanks to Scott, and thanks to Paint Your Dragon for help with Protomatter. This panel is blaring away and blinding me with rainbows right now, and it's <laughs> awesome, and I can't wait for all the rest of you to be able to run it too. Just wear sunglasses. Yes. Thanks, Jeff. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, <clears throat> group hug and a special shout out to Foamy Guy for his awesome uh, support work this week. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Katney's next. All right. Uh, so I have a huge list. Um, to Foamy Guy and Anic Data for taking on the Circuit Python helpers role on Discord and diving headfirst into the role. Uh, hug report to Anon Engineering for PRing the contribution of a project to the Python on Hardware weekly newsletter. To Foamy Guy for helping with that PR. To Dylan for plowing through the Pilot Black update implementation project. To Foamy Guy for always being on board to help with whatever. To Andrew Tribble for helping out a ton in the Help with Circuit Python channel on Discord. To Jerry N for catching an important missed reference in the Adafruit Community Code of Conduct update. And to Summersoft for putting in PRs to every library to update the code of conduct and then turning around and patching every library when it was pointed out that I missed updating something in the version of the code <laughs> of conduct that was used for the original update. And that's what I have. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Okay, King or North and KJW are lurking, so we're going to make her Melissa. Hello, let's see. Uh, I wanted to give a hug to Drew for and everybody else involved with the open source hardware uh, 
and making it a for making it a great conference and making it virtual because I was able to at least listen in. And to Tanu for streaming on Saturday, I still need to watch it, but it's mm -hmm. available now. Mm -hmm. And group hug to everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Next up, yeah. we have Marius. Hello. Hello. You hear me yep. today? <laughs> yep, you sound good. Nice. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Zoltan for Microlab and uh, for the time he took to answer to my questions. Thank you very much. And uh, Collective Hug, because you are the most amazing test the tech community I know, and uh, thank you to all. Awesome. Thanks, Marius. All right. Next up, we have Mr. Certainly, who's text only. Uh, I'll read that off. Uh, Mr. Certainly says, thank you to Drew Fustini and all the organizers of the Open Hardware Summit for an amazing conference. This is how you do a virtual event. I hope smaller communities who can't host an event in person will use this as a template. Uh, thank you to Tan Newt and Lady Ada in the chat for an excellent stream on Pi Day. It's super useful to see troubleshooting, debugging, and the overall thought process when building tools. All right. Uh, MS Costi is lurking. And Summersoft is text only, so I'll read that off. Summersoft says, uh, hug report to Katni and Foamy Guy for the Code of Conduct PR reviews and merges. We did 220 plus of them in under an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and a group hug from Summersoft. Nice work. Uh, and last up, we have. I'm gonna guess Simon. Is that? I don't. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, there's a Z in there. I don't know what to do with. Um, but Simon says, uh, "Thanks to Lady Ada for leading an awesome company and supporting open hardware and software. Uh, and thanks to Tan Newt and Katney for all and all other." All other contributors of CircuitPython for great work being done in software and learning guides. That is awesome. And yeah, please let me know how to say your name. I'm, I, I try to be good about it. Okay. With that, that's been Hug Reports. Thank you, everyone, for doing that. Uh, next up, we have status updates. Simon is totally okay. Okay, perfect. Um, if you want to try to teach me the correct way to say it, I'm open to that as well. But I'll Americanize it until then. OK, status updates. Uh, we do this as a round robin as well. Uh, so same thing. If you're text only or lurking, please make sure that the note stock is up to date with that as well. Uh, it just makes it quicker when I'm going around through everyone. Uh, but please take a couple of minutes to tell us both what you've been working on in the last week or so, and then what you plan on working on in the coming week. Uh, I will start. I'm never very good about doing a split like that, so uh, <laughs> no, it'll be what it is. Uh, for me, uh, I've been doing a lot of work on getting the microcontroller sleeping to save power. Uh, I wrapped up the initial sleep work for NRF52, uh, which I think is the most promising of them. And I've got M SAMD51 mostly working as well, but I uh, broke the SAMD21 during the time, so I have to go back at the start of this week and fix up the SAMD21 to make sure that it's actually at least uh, sleeping a bit. Um, after that, I'm going to take a look at the IMXRT and the STM32. Uh, they'll likely be easier because they have fewer dependencies on the existing clock. The thing with the SAMDs, for example, is that we have frequency in only for that, and it uses the time as a reference, as, or like the core ticks as a reference as well, so I had to change that. Um, one random fix I did uh, during the week was uh, fixing up the underscore BLEIO for a new uh, for Blinka uh, because there was a new Bleak version that broke it. And I should thank the person that let me know about it. And I f I'm forgetting who it was, but there was somebody else uh, on Discord who was super helpful in finding that issue and raising it to us. So we got it fixed. Um, I think this week I'm actually also going to work on Beely MIDI. Uh, it's one of the things that we'd like to do a learn guide on, and I don't think it'll take too, too much time. So I'm planning on slotting that in between uh, the SAMDs and the IMX and the STM32 work. And then uh, lastly, I worked on Tiny Logic Analyzer just a, a bit. Uh, I mostly talked on the stream, but it's hopefully helpful for people to watch. Uh, but Tiny Logic Analyzer, or not. That's not what I'm calling it. Tiny Logic Friend uh, is a logic analyzer uh, meant to run on existing Adafruit hardware. 
uh, the goal is to basically be able to debug I squared C with anything, uh, with any uh, circuit, oh, any Adafruit board uh, as the like logic analyzer part. So uh, check that out if you haven't seen it already. Um, but yeah, uh, that's where I'm at. Uh, Beely, MIDI, and more sleep work this week. Now let's circle around. And let me scroll, scroll, scroll. Anne is lurking, Carter's lurking, Seagrover is text only, so let me read that off. Uh, Seagrover says, uh, wrapped up the chronograph project coding and will post the repo soon. Switching to some woodworking projects for a change of pace, plan to get back to electronics and coding in a week or two. We'll audit this meeting for the next one or two sessions and we'll postpone the exam. <laughs> All right. Uh, Charles and Dakota are lurking, so we'll go to Dan. Well, sorry, got to scroll back. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Okay, I spent uh, several days trying to still trying to figure out why occasionally on the SAMD51 boards we get sprues writes into internal flash at zero sum locations. And I got a simpler test case, but it's still really not clear what's going on at all. Uh, I'll continue to work on that. I'm going to ask Microchip if they've seen anything like this. But so far, there's nothing in the errata that seems to indicate anything like this. I started working on um, a circuit Python version of all of the um, so-called Adafruit BLE board services, which we've already written in Arduino land and are used for the circuit playground Bluefruit. No, it's called the... Yeah, the Bluefoot Playground app. Right. And there's a UF2 that's written in Arduino that uh, you can put on either the Clue or the Circuit Playground Bluefruit. And we, we don't have a Circuit Python ver version of that. So I've started to work on the library of that. They're implementing like a, a dozen or so services that provide access to all the sensors on the board and the NeoPixels and stuff like that. And, but then uh, I'm working on that, but in the, in the short run, I'm actually going to uh, go back to working on the barbecue thermometer, the BLE barbecue thermometer, because we like to start a project associated with that. So I'll be doing that for the next day or two. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right. Dave P is lurking. So David Gloud is text only, I believe. So I'll read that off. Interrupt me if that's not true. Uh, David says, last week, one project a week keeps the virus away. Uh, driving Pimeroni scroll fat HD from CircuitPython by just adding a few lines to the IS31FL3731, as I said earlier. Uh, enhanced version of TFT Candy's hearts with scroll and replicating Maker Melissa's BLE controlled bit buggy. Uh, there's links in the notes for all those things if you want to check it out. Uh, next week, seriously tele teleworking for the first time. Uh, don't know because I did last week all the things I wanted to do next week, so... I uh, will stay tuned to see what happens. All right. Uh, next up, we have notes from Drew. Thank you to whomever is putting the links in there. Uh, Drew says the OHS goodies with the CircuitPython wrist badges are at NYU, which is currently closed due to COVID-19. Oshawa hopes to ship it, hopes to ship to ticket holders by the end of the month, but it depends on NYU policy. I did not go to New York City, so I did not have the production version of the badge. Therefore, I'm going to do manual rework on an earlier prototype so I can get the BME 680 sensor working. I plan to investigate the BLE functionality on the wrist badge. Alex Camilo has the idea that the wrist badge could transmit contact info. Awesome. Thanks, Drew. Uh, next up, we have notes from Foamy Guy. Foamy Guy says, last week, uh, tutorial links for the circuitpython.org downloads page. Documented and created issues for Seesaw NeoPixel brightness behavior and help out merging code of conduct updates. Uh, next week, get reacquainted with the Learn Guide system and work on decoding IR signals from some old wireless keyboards and word processors. Interesting. All right. Geek Guy is lurking, so let's go to Higher Effect. Uh, so this week I've been working, uh, continuing just work on um, 
uh, setting up for the F7 and the H7. Um, I wrapped up Pulse in uh, last week, so that's all. Uh, that's kind of the final non H7 and F7 thing that I was working on. Um, uh, so now we've got everything in the port moved over to kind of new names. Uh, so the STM 32 F4 port is now just the STM port, since we'll be doing a lot more than just the F4 now. Um, and uh, we swapped over to tiny USB's repo for all the, the ST drivers too. So um, kind of making everything a little bit more generic. Um, right now I'm re refactoring how the port manages packages, um, uh, the actual MCU physical Mm -hmm. package and, and mapping since uh, SD has kind of a lot of them and uh, and they really don't keep them consistent between families. <laughs> so there's there's many versions. Um, so I'm kind of uh, changing up a little bit how we how we deal with that just to, to acknowledge some of the differences that, that, that show up with that. Hmm. Um, I, I've also just been kind of making notes about all of the kind of potential difficulties looking at m how MicroPython handles the differences between the F4s and the F7s and H7s. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of mapping out all of the stuff that's going to be coming up with that. Um, this week, I'm going to be working just on wrapping up uh, the, I, I'll probably wrap up the um, pa uh, package stuff uh, today, um, but uh, making uh, all of the make file and macro visions uh, that need to happen to make the port more generic to support um, kind of all these different uh, ways of dealing with things in general. <laughs> There's just a lot of different stuff that'll need to change going from F4 to um, kind of STM32 in general. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thinking about how to incrementally add support um, to, you know, the various modules uh, that have already been added for the F4, so just everything from you know digital I/O and and uh, and you know kind of a basic microcontroller functions all the way up to things like you know pulse out and uh, uh, NeoPixel write. Um, you know, module by module, there's going to be a various amount of work. Some of them are going to take more work. Uh, some of them will take less. So um, hopefully, I'll I'm thinking about how I can kind of add support incrementally within a port. Mm -hmm. um, or for various modules so that, you know, I can get more stuff out sooner and then, and then follow up with more things later. Right. Um, but my goal for this week is to get something to compile for the mm -hmm. H743 Nucleo. Um, and then, uh, and then look into kind of what boards I want to get next for that. So, um, a lot of exciting stuff out there, like the OpenMV. And I just found out about the 32 Blit, which is sort of a, a gaming thing, which is apparently powerful enough to run Doom classic doom so that's mm -hmm. pretty exciting 480 <laughs> megahertz it's a lot of hertz a lot of hertz on a lot of board beefy board um, um so, yeah one, one thing i would say is that if you find that like the spy peripheral is very very different from the f4 i would encourage you to just instead of uh pound defining within a single file like just make a second set of common hal files for it. Second, yeah, I was considering that because there is a. Um, uh, I'm. I'll do a full review and decide whether that seems to be necessary. A lot of the MicroPython files that have this sort of multi-chip mm -hmm. support can be pretty messy. Um, yep. And uh, I haven't totally figured out whether we're going to be as messy as they are. Uh, <laughs> Um, my hope is that we might not, but um, but it, it, it kind of remains to be seen. So so I will I will get back to you on whether I'll be doing that. It, 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 what might also make sense is just to have like all of the individual components broken out into like a lower another abstraction layer, right? And have some basic calls, and then have you know have those mapped into the into the. Uh, have just another abstraction layer of, of mapping so that I can have everything be the same within the common how file, but have different, you know, stuff underneath. Yeah, so, depending on uh, how much ends up staying in the common how file. But I mean, that's the idea of using the STM how is that it gives us that abstraction. Right. Yeah. You, so no, I, that, I think MicroPython tends to use less of the ST how than I do. Yep. Um, so I've been using more of the ST how. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so hopefully that will make things cleaner for me. So um, I'm cool. still figuring out just how much uh, of that is, is going to. Sounds good. Just
Yeah, I just think I think we're gonna yeah. get to a model where we tr we tr truly treat peripherals as like just separate ICs that are versioned separately. Like that's the the reality of it. It's like the spy peripheral is just separate from the core. Mm. Uh, but Maybe we'll we could there. talk about that more in, in in the weeds. I, I'd like to explore that with you more further. I I want to understand. Sure, we can do that. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. That's it for me. Thanks, Harifact. Let's go to Jeff. Hello. Uh, so last week, kind of working backwards, I watched some of the OHS sessions on Friday. And knowing that those are immediately online and that I can go back to them any time left me free to do other stuff during the day. Um, anyway, I've been working on the CircuitPython bindings for this new LED panel driver called Protomatter. And it is pretty crazy. And it has to drive all of these low-level high-speed signals for the panel to work at all. Uh, but now it's working and I'm able to like put things in my frame buffer and then show the frame buffer on the device. And it's pretty fast. Uh, Tenet reminded me that last week I worked on F strings, which will be pretty amazing to have. And was that just last week? <laughs> and I also, I think last week fixed the meeting calendar so that it works on multiple uh, different pieces of viewer software. So that's, uh, some online viewer that I used, and Google Calendar, and then one that Scott used. So this is now kind of the official meeting calendar, and it should show the time in your time zone when you're using a compliant viewer program. Uh, and, and then it's on us to keep that up to date, and I guess show up whatever time it says, right? Uh, so anyway, this week, continuing work on Protomatter, I have to imagine that uh, that is going to extend into writing a guide or a guide page. And also it will involve creating my first uh, CircuitPython library because there's a small amount of kind of wrapper code that in the current form is connecting pixel buff to the LED display. Although Scott and I are due to have a discussion about whether that's the direction that we want to go in or whether we want to change it up now while it's easy. Uh, if I finish that up, or when I need a break, I'll look at issues. I do want to look at that uh, particle status LED problem, which um, I don't think it's hugely tricky, but uh, it just needs some work before it will function like we really want. Mm -hmm. And I need to remember to keep on top of those PR reviews. For ongoing fun stuff, since I've been playing with ICS files, I think I should convert my light alarm to Adafruit Blinka and add support for reading the alarm times from a uh, calendar hosted potentially on the internet. <laughs> so it is already running on a Pi 3, but this will be my first experience with Blinka and my first with uh, digesting calendars rather than producing them. And also I realized I should do something with Adafruit IO and I had the idea of I could log my CircuitPython building activity. So like... Uh, you know, my number of successful builds would tick up by one. My number of failed builds would tick up by 10. And mm -hmm. I can come back and look at those statistics later. I also like That's the idea of uh, logging build sizes to Adafruit IO. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. Um, so we could keep so track like, of how big CircuitPython is over time. Right. So there would be one feed per board, mm -hmm. per board and language. So yeah. like that, that would be a lot of feeds. Yes. Yeah, I'll think about that. I that wonder if neat. there's a knob they can exempt us from the <laughs> rate limit. <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, yeah, maybe I'll look into that. Cool. But you know who has time? I don't know. If only we were all just stuck at home and had plenty of time to work on stuff. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Thank you. All right. Jerry. Um, yeah, so finally got a PR submitted for one of the, these RFM 69 update that I've been working on for way too long. Um, and just a, a heads up, so and it, it, it's waiting for review. One of the problems is, is, is finding someone who's got the, got the hardware and the, and the patience to test it. But um, that, that's not a problem. It, it can wait. And um, one thing I ran into is that there's a bunch of changes, and, and when I tried to do, um, submit my um, commit my changes. It failed the uh, the build process for the uh, d updates to the, the for the docs file, which I hadn't changed anything in. Mm -hmm. But all I did was had to basically do a pull of upstream master, remerge it, and it magically fixed whatever whatever it was complaining about. But if people run into that, that might be something you need to do. I think there was a blip in the objects 
service or something. Okay. Um, so it might have been so, just a transient that you hit. Okay, good. Um, and so I, I implemented the same changes that I did in 6.9 to the 9x um, system, but I'll wait till the one is accepted so that I can make the changes that are needed in it before I PR the the RFM 9x stuff. But uh, it's it's it'll be ready to go whenever that gets cleared. And um, oh yeah, I, I did a quick just some testing of this this particle xenon status LED stuff uh, to confirm an issue that was reported by uh, Southern Dragon. Uh, next week, so my plan is to is to finish up the 9x stuff and uh, hopefully get you know get the PR merged for the 6.9. And then uh, then I really still want it. There's a lot more work to do on it. I'm really not all that happy with with the stat current state of affairs. It's it's better. It's a step in the right direction, but it's certainly not where I want it to be. So now I can start thinking about doing more things with it. And otherwise, I've got lots of toys here to play with. I'll keep doing that. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Katni. Hello. So last week, I uh, published the Feather Sense Guide. Um, worked with Erin, uh, who is, goes by Fire Pixie, on getting code adapted for her staff project. Um, both in uh, making the original code she was using work the way that she wanted and helping her linting uh, once it was submitted. Um, I started the guide for the bonsai buckaroo. Um, there's a bit left to do on that. I went through a number of pilot black PRs, renamed Adafruit Circuit Python Radio to Adafruit Circuit Python BLE Radio, so that's more specific and clear, and worked with Summersoft to get the code of conduct updated across all the libraries. There'd been enough drift in the updates that an initial patch wasn't viable, so it required making a PR to every lib and then merging said PRs, and then Summersoft patching them all afterwards because I missed something. So uh, this week, uh, this is today's Library Monday PR edition. I have another probably 70 PRs to go through for the Pilot Black stuff, and more are coming all the time. Um, and once I get through all that, I will continue working on the uh, Bonsai Buckaroo Guide, and I think that just about covers everything I've got going on. Awesome. Thanks, Katni. I, I had this moment of seeing the Seinfeld episode where Newman's complaining about the mail just keep it just keeps coming. <laughs> and that's what I thought of the uh, the black lint PRs. They just keep coming. Okay, uh, Maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I tested the PRs on displays just to make sure they still worked, and they did. I worked on fixing some rotation issues on the capacitive touch display on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I worked on a guide for adding boards to platform to detect, and that'll be coming out soon. And I started on a guide for adding Blinka, and this week I'm going to continue on that guide and kind of go from there. Great. And that's it. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, next up we have Marius. Yes, uh, so last week I started uh, to work with uh, Bluetooth, the first projects to, to test. Mm -hmm. uh, it worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I also added uh, Fractal. I just post the image mm -hmm. on the chat. Nice. It's so it's generated. Uh, first version took uh, uh, fifty seconds. Mm -hmm. The last version, using Microlab, you take six to seven seconds. Nice. And in these seven seconds, yeah, there is a one point point five seconds uh, for just transferring data into the bitmap. Mm. So this week I will. Look at that to to try to to slice that to 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 quicken the, the, the process of uh, of filling a bitmap object mm -hmm. because it's it's very slow. I I think I can speed up uh, this project uh, and 
I, I, I hope a lot of uh, other projects. Uh, and what I want to work to this week, uh, translating a project I made in French uh, for my son. And so I will translate it in English for you all. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a quiz uh, buzzer system for three players and one uh, uh, arbitre. Um, yeah, well, well. <clears throat> and uh, what else? Uh, perhaps a new fractal. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, somebody have uh, work uh, for me, I take it. <laughs> okay. It's safe. <laughs> um, so, uh, good week to all. Are you on the Adafruit jobs board? Uh, not yet. I want to uh, make uh, a curriculum there. Uh, I, I say I, I saw the place, okay. so I will uh, update uh, there. Yeah, I, that's what I would recommend. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marius. All right, Mr. Certainly and MS Costi are lurking. Summersoft is text only, so I'll read those uh, uh, Summersoft notes off after I let my brain take a time code. Uh, last week, Summersoft says, uh, libraries and cookie cutter, patch the code of conduct.md, and then patch the patches. <laughs> Apologies again for the email explosion if you got all the notifications. On Action CI CircuitPython Libs, the centralized CI script, uh, submitted a PR to remove the pip installs for Pilot Black and Sphinx and the theme. Uh, for Adabot, uh, reworked and re-enabled the library infrastructure validator that checks the version of Pilot using CI. During all that patching, discovered and fixed the repo discovery function was missing some CircuitPython repos that are forks. This was caused by my own doing in the past in an effort to reduce API requests. Didn't realize at the time that some of Adafruit's re repos are actually forks. And with that, there are a few repos that didn't read the actions patch to move Pilot Black and Sphinx installs. Uh, this week, get the actions patch as done for those missed above. Update CircuitPython.org's Adabot to pull in the above changes. And a third attempt, further research Adabot using Boto3 for core metrics in AWS. Thank you, Summersoft. Okay, and last but not least, uh, Stargirl, do you have stuff? I know you just dropped in. Um, but uh, I'll read... Okay, Stargirl's lurking. Uh, I'll read off Simon's stuff. Simon says, uh, last week, fight again with my ESP32 coprocessor to make it working via SPI with the SAMD51 on the board that which I've created. Unfortunately, so far, i failed. I think that I'll need uh, Brent Rue to help in this subject. Uh, GitHub issue is created. Uh, please link to the issue, too, so we can help with that as well. Uh, learning Git and GitHub to use more on a daily basis. Uh, and this week, check and learn how to use more libraries for CircuitPython. Awesome, and welcome to the meeting. Thanks for dropping in. Okay. Uh, that is it for status updates. So next up, we have the, the last section, which is in the weeds. Uh, we have one topic, and then we were also going to talk about um, the peripheral stuff. So let me just make a note to myself about that. So first and foremost, we have KJW. Uh, do you want to unmute and tell us about it? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound good. Um, so I've been writing um, a small piece of CircuitPython, or it started small, uh, for a imminent guide article. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the past, I suppose things have been quite small. And I think with particularly with the bigger boards like the Clue, um, I've noticed the ability certainly to write a program that's quite large is there. And um, after a while, my program actually became quite buggy. So it was kind of the first time where I sort of wanted to reach for a debugger. Uh, in the past, particularly for library development, I've used CPython to do a lot of unit testing. Um, so on the library side, when you're doing libraries, the unit testing approach works well. And I do have... Um, some classes in my uh, application, which I'm now testing actually with some unit tests. And I was using that to sort of find some of the bugs and to sort of experiment with the bugs and work out what was going on. 
Um, but it's the first time it's highlighted for me, at least, the the need for something like a debugger. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of looking around to see um, what's out there. And I think in the Arduino world as well, actually, this is a bit of a gap uh, mm -hmm. in that you've got obviously something that very easily lets you write some code. But um, I suppose most of us are used to using quite sophisticated features now in IDEs with very integrated debugging. And uh, I was just kind of curious uh, how much need there was, um, and particularly from you know the typical programmer, not necessarily someone who can sort of dive in and who's got kind of hardware debugging and can understand perhaps what the Python um, system is doing under the covers. Um, Yeah, so I think um, obviously this has come up before. You have a link in the notes about uh, CircuitPython issue 298 where folks have asked for this. Um, I think it would be very cool. The thing is, the but on that statement is that I, I don't think it should be a priority for us to work on uh, because it in itself doesn't unlock. Like our focus is on beginners and beginners tend to have a lot, uh, like not very much code. So when it comes to doing things like working on BLE MIDI versus working on the debugger stuff, I have to pick BLE MIDI because that enables another sort of pro class of projects for people to do. Uh, working on sleep is the same way um, where it's like without that sleep functionality, you can't do like as long battery powered stuff as you could otherwise. So I think uh, if somebody did the debugger work, that would be awesome and epic and good to get in. Um, you mentioned in the notes as well that mu mu would be a way to do it, and I would I would expect. Um, I mean, I haven't talked to Nicholas about this, but I would expect that he would also push back on the idea that it needs to be in mu. Uh, that being said, I think the person who I haven't actually been in contact with yet and should have hug reported, but uh, somebody's working on a Circuit Python VS Code extension, and to me, that's the place that. Um, would be the the most interesting to see the debugger integration um yeah i suppose for me i was thinking about it actually running the code on the board with a remote debugging mm -hmm. uh but I, I suppose there's obviously other options as well for perhaps for emulating the boards um i mean you see it in um i suppose the make code world mm -hmm. um at least on the make code arcade they've got a reasonable debugger in that Mm hmm. Interesting. I, I mean, I haven't looked at I haven't looked at make code very much. Um, I think I think the ideal would be that it would be running on the hardware. And like the thing is, that I've never really used the debugger for Python myself, so I don't have a lot of experience. Like I, don't, I, I have zero experience with that. So I don't really have an idea of whether there's just a few. I think there's a few primitives under the hood that that the PDB hooks into, but I just don't have that background. So I feel like this is something we should definitely merge in if, if there's stuff that we need to do. Uh, yes, thank you, Simon. The Joe DeVivo stuff is really, really interesting. I tried to reach out through an issue and because uh, I noticed that there's stubs for all the native C modules in there as well, which is something that I'm really keen on having uh, for autocomplete. Um, but uh, I think that is the right place to do debugger. And I imagine VS Code has a way to like control a debugger under the hood as well. So um, I would reach out to Joe and see if you can't coordinate with Joe on, on doing that. And of course, if there's, if there's like, oh, I need this one thing in CircuitPython, we can talk about how to get those, that lowest level stuff in there. Um, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> OK, I'll have a look at Yeah, I, I was unaware of the. Um... Uh, the Joe DeVevio stuff. So I'll have a look at that. Yeah. Thanks. And it's super new. Like, I think I, it's only been on my radar for like the last week. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's, it looks really good, though. I like browse the repo and it had like all those stubs and stuff. So uh, thanks, Katni, for for attending. Um, okay. We've got <laughs> it's version 001. Okay. I think the thing that you need in the core is this sys.setTrace, and that's in MicroPython now, so it might come in if we ever do this uh, fabled merge from MicroPython into CircuitPython again. Okay. I mean, that is something I'd like to do. I know. 
Um, I would like it too. Yeah, it's just, it's a lot of work. We got to get some other stuff out first. Um, okay, thanks for that, Jeff. And so, yeah, I think uh, KJW, I, th I think, yeah, we should do it at some point. It's not a huge priority for those of us uh, funded by Adafruit. Um, but yeah, yeah, we, we, the, we're currently based on somewhere between 1.11 and 1.12, I believe. We actually asked Damien which commit we should pick between there. And I would like to do one more, but I, it, it gets harder and harder as, as time goes on. So I don't, I'm not sure whether we'll do that many more. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, let me take a time code. Uh, Higher Effect and I just wanted to chat a bit more about the, the structure stuff. Um, so we were talking about the STM 32 F4 versus the F7 and H7 ports. And, uh, I was, I, I think what we're doing or what we should think about in the long term for a structure of circuit Python is thinking less about chip families and more about, um, they're all cortex M's or they're mostly cortex M's with different peripherals on the outside and how they're connected together. Um, this, this idea of mine has kind of stemmed from the FPGA world, right? Where in FPGAs, you can just pick a CPU to go in the middle and then you can pick all of the peripherals to go in the SOC, the system on chip along with it. So I, I'm imagining a world where, and we're kind of in this world already with um, tiny USB where like there's some company that makes a USB IP, which is like the name for the like, how the gates are all hooked up. Uh, there's some some USB IP that like multiple vendors like ST and I think uh, NXP both use. So like there's no reason to have two copies of that implementation. We can factor that out and just have a like a USB implementation for a particular IP. And I think if we were able to dig in and derive it, we'd find that that's actually more true for uh, chip families as well. Um, just like for our peripherals in general uh i've come to i think go ahead i'm oh, sorry go ahead finish your thought please i i was just gonna say that i think um i i've i've come to think of peripherals in a system as on a chip in the very in a very similar way that i think about like i squared c sensors that you have on a board right like it's just a separate set of logic that is running independently except there's like a a way to write commands and, and read state back and forth. Now, on a, in, in a system on a chip, there's interrupt lines and there's uh, like a wide, like 32-bit bus between them. But the reality or the, the mental model that I have is actually more similar to the just like peripherals are independent. The versioning of peripherals is independent and it would be nice to like move to a world where we think about that that more broadly that way. Yeah, I guess my my question is, I I feel like we're we're not necessarily that far from that already, are we? I mean, we have the common how we have kind of separate versioning, and then you know we have the ports separated into the ports also have to hold you know the board and package and peripheral information, right. which is really just you know abstractions like basically you know yeah beyond the peripherals being different. You just have to know how they're physically mapped onto the pins, you know? Right, right. Um, and that's pretty much all the information that's really in a port, you know? I mean, we, we don't have too much else. So I guess my yeah. question to you would be, uh, is there stuff that you envision changing in the future to that you think would, like, take this one step further in being its own sort of unique versioning? Yeah, I think kind of what I would, if I had to guess at the long term... I would kind of move the common HAL stuff out of particular ports directory and have that as a top level. So you'd say like common HAL, bus IO, and then you would have um, different peripheral types or something like underneath that instead. And then you could have like another top level for boards that just does board level stuff. So you, you like move away from this idea that it's per vendor and more on a like 
per board kind of basis, but. Um, Interesting. So, so we would have we would have like we would have a different common hell for the peripherals. That's like the base. So I don't know. If, yeah. I mean, in some cases, I imagine that that would be because there's some stuff that I've been able to do structurally very you know much the same right. as you know NRF and Atmel, which like uh, pulse in is a good example. You know, mm -hmm. it's just basically the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, and then there's been other stuff that has had to be different mm -hmm. because of vendor differences, uh, particularly in terms of how um, you know, interrupts and stuff are handled, uh, which would right. be much more annoying to to handle if it was if I was doing them on a on a lower level than than where I am. Mm -hmm. um, that might be able to be avoided if everything was done on the register level. Right. Like a hundred percent of everything was done on the register level, um, but that would just be my concern: is that there are, you know, um, you can kind of just track that in terms of like the files that have different static functions to handle, you know, mm -hmm. non-common house static functions to handle different right. stuff. Um, yeah, and I like I'm not to say I, I'm not trying to say that, like this is gonna something we're gonna do right now, but like this is when you're thinking about should i do a bunch of pound defines in the same file to have the same file shared between f4 and f7 i don't think like if they're very different then they should you shouldn't do that you should do it at the build uh, you should do it at the build level like, so yeah file just inclusion keeping, level yeah just keeping keeping having whole distinct right so like when we did samd51 after 21 like the peripherals were basically the same except there was a few cases where like they had like sandy 21 had this weird thing where you'd have to like write an index to a register and then access shared registers whereas like on right. 51 they just had copies of the shared registers for every index um yeah. but that was that was the extent of it generally so could we, could we have like a common how could we actually have like different common how folders like could we have like common how and then have it have it subdirect have subdirectories within the common hall directory in the same way that we have like i have a peripherals you know i have the peripherals mm -hmm. directory and then i have all the different you know i have i have stm32 f4 i'll be adding stm32 f7 you know i'm adding this new packages director which has the f4 and f7 packages basically right. um and uh, could we do something like that for the, the common how, where it's like the common how directory that has subdirectories for the, F, the F4, F7, or the 51, 21, or whatever you need? Right. I think, have... I think potentially, but not necessarily. That's the. I don't know if F7 is like the right boundaries that you actually want. You may actually want like a a different kind of differentiation. I wish they would tell us like just straight up like who made the IP and what version it was, but. But I haven't been right. able to find that info. Dan, do you have comments? I uh, the only thing I would say is I did a I did something. I mean, we certainly have these these peripherals thing where you can factor some of that stuff out. And then the other is that I did some minor stuff in, in the make file when I was doing different implementations of touch in. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might. I'm not sure if it's helpful or not, but you might look at how I differentiate between boards in that way. That was really actually in shared modules, or it was there was some trickery in the make files to make that work properly. Mm -hmm. But it made it, it made it possible to do a split, not in a particular family, but between ports. Mm -hmm. But still, the, the the issue that I often have is that you know there's really there's in in ST in particular. Um, I mean, and maybe other board boards that I just am not. See, you know, they really, there's a lot that's shared. And then they love to just tweak like one thing, you know, <laughs> like if they, they share like everything, like in a package, they'll share like every single pin in the package. But then they change this like one power pin or something, right. you know, so you have to have a conditional there. Or like every single register is the same except for this one register where they swapped it out for something else, mm -hmm. you know. And and this happens all the time. And so it really like there's you have to make a lot of calls about whether you want to have you know all this stuff kind of copy pasted. You're gonna have it again, mm -hmm. or 
are you going to, you know, are you going to abstract it down to the, the level or are you going to do something in between mm-hmm. where you have, you know, just these little specific conditionals in there? It's kind of like that stuff comes up a lot. It's just, yeah. you know, often I do end up going for the balance because if I were to just make, you know, endless copies of every single variation that they have right. on, you know, packages or implementations, I would just end up with with just tons and tons of repeated, you know, lines of code, mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of lines. But if I try to, you know, do it all in one thing, it gets really confusing because <laughs> right. they just they just make too many tweaks. Yeah. So um, anyway, all right. Well, that's my I two think, cents. Yeah, no, I think as check. hopefully that in pe- like hopefully that'll be in the back of your mind as you go through this and like let's plan on circling back in a couple days and seeing where you where you end up with it um and uh just to to uh just want to poke on that the fpga do we have any ambitions to like do any fpga stuff like i I be supported on fpga uh, i think in the long term yes I don't think that Adafruit's going to be the people that fund that or drive that. Um, yeah, that's probably true. But I had conversations with uh, Peter Esden Temp- Tempke from One Bits Squared about it. Uh, mm-hmm. So I know it's on his radar. And, and I think I was just looking at it this weekend, actually, because it's something that does interest me. I think it's still just too early. I think that um, Peter and Sean Zobs and Tim Ansel, they're all doing really good work pushing to make FPGAs easier and more open. They're just, yeah. it still needs more time. <laughs> like, yeah, I've, I, I mean, I, I mention it just because I've been having a friend who's, who's a pretty like deep level friend. He like does, you know, kind of crazy stuff. But he's been talking to me about MeGen or MeGen, which yeah. is Python descriptions of for FPGAs. So you use Python instead of a, of a, of a, um, for a description language. Right. Um, and it just strikes me as like, it would be kind of a bonkers idea where you like, you know, use Python to design your own custom chip with its own processor and all the peripherals that you specifically want, you know, oh, yeah. uh, for your project and then run the whole thing in circuit Python. I don't know. That makes me excited as a concept, but um, but yeah, it does seem to be a little ways off. Right. Point. The thing, the thing that I've been trying to push them <laughs> towards is this idea that we should, we as FPGA owners should be able to, like, who bought it from Adafruit, should not have to run FPGA tooling at all. We should be able to get a copy of some bits that we can drag and drop over, and then the FPGA acts like a particular system on a chip. And that okay. system on a chip should have all the documentation and tooling that a standard microcontroller would also have. Um, and so I it would be the drag and drop thing is really going to be the make or break. I feel like you know having that be an accessible process. Um, I exactly agree. And uh, Sean has done some awesome work and with the what they call the faux boot bootloader, which is on the FOMU, which you can buy off Adafruit, and I just got one. Um, but it doesn't do drag and drop. It does DFU. And DFU is fine and it's well documented, but it requires a program install. And I don't think they'll get to the ease of use point until it's actually drag and drop. Um, cool. Well, thanks for the update. I yeah. appreciate it. So I think it'll work. I, I, I think we'll get there. It's just like we're not, Adafruit is not the people that's driving it. I, I just, I, you know, I think of it just because you were talking about unlocking projects before, and I feel like a lot of people, if they're going to use an uh, FPGA, it's often because they need like a bunch of copies of something, right? Like they need a bunch of different ice cream things. And if you could have an, a circuit Python accessible processor where you can just drag and drop in, you know, the 15 ice cream C lines that you need or whatever it is, right? That, that does, that might unlock you know, even hobby level projects, just crazy hobby level projects that nobody thought were. Possible before. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think anyway, we'll get not, there. Not, not indicating. Like, yeah, there's also the new group gets for the orange crab, which is a feather form factor, e, uh, ECP five. 
which I think could run like a 72 megahertz Risk Five core. So, but it's also like a hundred dollars or something. Yeah, you t they tend to get up in price too. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll that's, get there. That's all exciting to hear. So, thanks for the links. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to Jeff for a quick update on Microlab. Sure. There we go. Uh, yeah. So I haven't really heard anything subsequent to the PR being merged and this guide going out that indicates we have any killer problems. Okay. I know that um, Zoltan has some directions that he wants to take you lab, um, but after, mm -hmm. uh, I think after we do 510. Okay. So from my point of view, uh, what I would like to do is just verify that there's nothing that we haven't pulled in via our sub-module mm -hmm. that we want. Mm -hmm. I think it's a small number of commits to review, and if nothing turns up there, then I believe it's good. Okay. I think the one thing we wanted to make sure to do was move something to extra. Uh, right. We were moving Spectrum and maybe renaming it to be like SciPy. Okay. And one of those two things is done upstream and not pulled in yet, and I don't know whether the other was done subsequently. Okay. And I should write those down on a to-do list for myself so that I do not forget them. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind running that down, that would be awesome. But I think we could either just do five one stable or we could actually just do like a five one re release candidate zero i think it probably needs to be release candidate don't you i think it's fine because then we actually have something a little newer on the downloads page <laughs> uh but so i'm happy to just have it there for a bit like that's totally fine all right so what what did we say review review new upstream commits yeah and just make sure that the extra move was done Is that it, All right. Jeff? Yeah, and you'll make a branch. You'll make a 5.1. 5 5.1 branch, yeah. 5.1x branch. There's a 5.0x branch, so then you'll make a 5.1x branch uh, when you think the master is in good shape. Okay, you'd like me to create that branch? It doesn't matter. Yeah, you could I mean, do that. I, th I think it's a good thing for you to figure out how to do, and we could actually yeah. teach you how to do the release as well. Mwahaha. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting amount of work. <laughs> Which is why it's better for us to share it between the three of us. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap up. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for sometime in March. <laughs> March 16th, 2020. Uh, I'm Scott. I work for Adafruit on CircuitPython along with a number of folks in this. So please support Adafruit at adafruit.com uh, to continue uh, their funding of CircuitPython. If you don't know, uh, I'm surprised you got this far, but CircuitPython is a uh, beginner-oriented Python for microcontrollers. Uh, this meeting happens every week on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, and Dan, you're unmuted. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm typing away, huh? Okay. You are typing away. Uh, we'd love to see you on our Discord. Uh, lots of folks are staying at home right now. Um, so please reach out to us if you need a community online. We're, we're excellent at that. We're an excellent community. Um, again, ADAFRU to IT slash discord meeting has been recorded and it's available on, uh, podcast services along with the Adafruit YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Adafruit. If you have two hours where you want to just watch me debug stuff, uh, there is a video on there from this weekend of me not working on circuit Python, but on a SAMD 51 nonetheless. And uh, lastly, uh, I think, well, two things. Next week, I think we're on the same schedule. I will uh, put a note to CircuitPythonistas with the note stock for next week later this afternoon. So keep an eye out for that. If you're not a CircuitPythonista, please let us know and we'd be happy to add you into that role. And uh, finally, uh, we've heard about lots of really cool projects uh, in this meeting and previous meetings. Uh, Adafruit runs a show and tell online at on Wednesdays, and this week we're starting uh, to make it an hour long and not just a half an hour long. So if you have projects you haven't shown off before and you happen to be working from home, um, take some time. It's uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Uh, those of you in Europe, and beware that we've 
switch times here in the US and it's about to switch. You'll switch soon and that'll screw things up. But be aware of that. Uh, we'd love to see you all on show and tell and uh, chat with you on the Discord. Um, I think we're planning on doing an hour for a while, but um, I may be wrong. Keep an eye on the Adafruit blog for details about that. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, and it's great to uh, chat with you every week and all day during the week. So thanks everyone. And we'll talk to you all next week or sooner. <laughs>